Hey Bucket Pond friends, today on the channel we are exploring the bladder snail breeding experiment. This is two weeks after setup and I'm very excited to share them with you. So we have three unique jar aquariums here. They were all set up with identical materials and plants to start with. Uh, the only difference being that I put two bladder snails in each jar from different populations. Normal bladder snails, mutagen exposed bladder snails, and the offspring of a mutagen exposed individual. So jars one, two, and three. Now when I talk about mutagens, I'm talking about things that have affected our snails to cause them to look like this and to develop some unusual traits. So I'm hoping that those traits will continue into their offspring and so far it seems that they will. But we'll look more at jar number three in the future here in a little bit. And jar number two is where I want to focus right now because right away I see something very interesting. There's a hatchling in here. Now, these jars have only been running for two weeks, and that is technically long enough for a bladder snail to lay some eggs and for them to hatch. But comparing jar number two against our other jars, we see no hatchlings in the other tanks, so that's really strange. It looks like our mutagen exposed bladder snails are willing to breed and mature possibly more quickly than their cousins. Now that could be an effect of just being raised outdoors. Um, life's a little harder out in the ponds than it is in here in the jars, you know. So maybe that has triggered them to grow up a little faster or to work a little harder at reproduction. That's my theory. But I don't see any adults in here. And that makes me worry. You know, uh, yeah, I don't see any empty shells. I just don't see them. Now this tank is very cloudy and that's unusual because all three jars were started with the exact same material. I believe that jar number two here has grown to resemble the pond where the snails came from. They came in with microbes and things on them from that mutagen uh, exposed pond, from that polluted pond is the best way to say it. So I believe that they brought those microbes in with them and they've affected this jar causing it to go more green. Uh, in contrast, in jar number one here, these snails came from my guppy tank, right? And the water looks very much like this. Just a hint of green water, just enough to make use of it as a big, big plant in my guppy tank uh, without it blocking our vision. But here in jar number one, with the standard bladder snails, we see that, yes, there are eggs in here. And they are close to hatching, judging by this bad shot I got here. They are being inspected by our uh, larger ostracods. You may be familiar with them if you've watched my channel. A few of you guys have asked about them here and there, and uh, they seem to be kind of interesting, right? So, yeah, they are a larger type of ostracod than the original. Hang on one second. Yeah, so they are a larger type of ostracod, and I'll just leave it at that. Hang on. All right, <laughs> so yes, they have laid eggs in their aquarium. The snails are reproducing in here, but not quite as quickly as in jar number two. So that's one reason I set up these projects was to compare uh, the different jars against each other, the different strains of bladder snails against one another. And so far, I think we're learning something interesting. The snails from outside are definitely willing to breed and grow up a little faster. That may be because of pressures outdoors, environmental pressures, or an effect of the mutagen that has damaged their DNA. So let's look again at them here in jar number two. And we have an egg sack up here, which appears to be empty. That might be where that hatchling came from. And you'll see that it is laid above the surface of the water. And the ostracods are having a hard time getting up there. Whereas in jar number one, they are laying their eggs directly underwater. Now, typically this is a, an action of a bladder snail to avoid predators. That's what I've noticed. If they live in aquariums that have a lot of little pesky fish that like to peck at them and at their eggs, they will try to lay their eggs up above the surface. If they believe there are crayfish, if they detect predators in the water, they'll do something similar. They'll lay their eggs up out of the water. And so the fact that they're doing it here in jar number two makes me wonder, there are no predators in here. The predators. There are no enemies other than some microfauna. So what do the snails know that we don't know? And more importantly, 
our two bladder snails that we had in here, I don't know if they're gone or if they're just hidden. Now here in jar number three, these are the descendants of a mutagen exposed snail named Tails, who I showed you earlier in the video. And yes, much in the same way, this jar has grown to resemble Tails Aquarium. Tails, Tails is. Uh, <laughs> but it's grown to resemble the other aquarium that these snails came from. There's one of our adults now who is happily scooting around on the surface of the jar. And I didn't see eggs. In, oh, wait, wait. No. No, it's just a distortion in the glass. But I do see that our ostracods are definitely interested in the bladder snails. And that's that's a little unusual. Uh, maybe they're just cleaning up debris from its shell or, um, I don't know, biofilm growing on the snail. These jars were set up very clean and new. And so that may have affected our ostracods. They seem to be searching for food. It's, uh, that's okay, though. Yeah. They're really cool, though. Uh, I do like these ostracods. They came to us in a strange way, and we've been raising them for a while now. They typically get into my jars and become a very dominant force within the nano ecosystems that we like to build. They are definitely pestering our poor bladder snail. And I've sped up the footage here a little bit just so we can see they repeatedly return to check the snail out. And he seems to be uh, scooting around trying to avoid them. But I could be reading too much into this right now. Um, but these are two of my favorite species, and that is one of Tails' descendants. You can see a little bit of dark patch on the end of his foot. Uh, the lighting in here is not great for that project, for that purpose. Uh, using the backlighting, it kind of shadows the foreground of anything that sticks to the glass. So, yeah, maybe I'll adjust that in the future. But it looks like everybody's hungry, so I'm going to give them a slice of cucumber. A good slice cut in half, uh, maybe a quarter inch, something like that. I don't want to overfeed the tanks. Too much food can become uh, toxic and nasty. But not enough food and, you know, nobody will reproduce. So it's a difficult balance. You'll notice I use cucumbers on a lot of my projects, and that's because uh, they're readily available, they're cheap, and so far everything that eats cucumbers has been very friendly and effective for my aquariums. Um, even our millipedes that we raise for our terrestrial projects, they are uh, happy with cucumbers as well. So I put the lids back on the jars. They do have an air hole for a little bit of airflow, and I think jar number one and number three actually look pretty cool. I look forward to that uh, guppy grass coming back and really thriving in time. But I've mentioned Tails a few times, and I want to check out his tank. It looks a little crazy, you guys. And, yeah, I don't know. Let's look inside. Now, Tails typically hangs out down around those rocks. And I admit it, I cannot see him. But I see one of his children right there. <laughs> and I see a whole ton of mi microfauna, excuse me. Uh, no, it looks like our um, Daphnia and our Ostracods may be uh, the dominant life form within this jar, or life forms, rather. Uh, but yes, yes, this jar is doing really well. We should have a few more hatchlings, but I haven't fed them just yet, so they're kind of dispersed throughout the substrate. Um, I worry about having large rocks in a bladder snail aquarium because they kind of want to get down in there, and um, I'm just always worried they're going to get stuck, you know, and, and suffocate. Um, so we're going to add a chunk of cucumber here. There's a few more of Tails' little friends or little descendants around the surface in the duckweed. And here's that great little guy right here. Definitely ostracods and taphnia. Very active little ecosystem. And yeah, I think that's really cool. That's a very young descendant of Tails there. Very, very young, very small. And I think that's great. You know, I love seeing our little baby bladder snails and all of our little friends here uh, cooperating. Their aquarium is very clear, and um, it's not bad looking. I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, you know, I've given up trying to make those beautiful, like, gallery, uh, amazing aquariums because, one, I just don't have that kind of budget, and two, I just don't have that kind of time to run maintenance. But these natural unusual tanks that we build here on the channel something about it you know you don't have to spend a bunch you don't have to uh, spend all day working on this particular jar it's just it's just fun it's interesting the effort I could put into one 
big aquarium I could put into like 30 little jars. And that's part of the charm for me. Though I do maintain, um, well, one large aquarium right now. Um, you know, there's, there's a charm, there's a, a fun aspect in there as well. So, you know, whether you do terrariums or traditional fish tanks or any of that kind of stuff, you know, I think that we can all find common ground and admit that we all think uh, that building ecosystems in uh, creative ways is fun and interesting. So right now I'm just taking a few samples from Tails Aquarium. I'm trying to bring some of that beneficial bacteria and uh, the Daphnia specifically into these other jars. I want to uh, encourage you know the clarity that we see in Tails' tank. And there's both of our uh, adults there in jar number three. And I still haven't seen any adults in jar number two. Now it is cloudy, so who's to say? But bladder snails can be more elusive than you might think. Anyway, guys, here I am after doing some maintenance on another project, and we've been letting the snails come up to the surface. I was hoping we'd see more adults in number two, like we have in number three here. Uh, but that's okay. There's at least a couple hatchlings in there, and I want to show you guys this. You may remember that I captured a weird grass plant recently from a ditch, and I was like, oh, I better get this out of this jar before it dies, you know. Check it out. Oh my god, check it out. What is this, like bulrush? I don't know. I'm about to figure that out, but it is amazing. And I think that I could grow this in a jar, definitely in the pool ponds. So yeah, just a little quick update on that. But yeah, guys, thank you so much. Um, I hope that this video was not too hard to follow. Uh, we have some unusual developments. It seems as though our mutant snails reproduce more quickly. Um, it seems as though they might be a bit more fragile as well, as I believe they have died in number two and left their offspring to take their place. Um, we're hoping for the best. I'll be back with another video about these guys soon, but so far we have seen at least one slight difference in that our new snails want to breed a little bit more quickly. And uh, that may be useful. Hopefully that is a genetic trait. If we see that continuing throughout their offspring, then we'll know that... Uh, Hey, we have more aggressive, more dominant bladder snails who breed more quickly. That's awesome. Might be useful as well.